the danger of unconfessed sin is what I'm going to talk about. I usually have an idea of something I'm going to talk about and then something happens or someone I have a conversation with someone and then I it's so highlighted in my mind that I end up changing it almost at the last minute but as born-again children of God if we choose to remain in our sin then we're choosing the consequences that go with that choice and broken fellowship with God and with others and the lack of growth spiritually are simply two of the major consequences of that. However, those who persist in sinning when they call themselves born again need to re-examine their true relationship with God because the Bible is clear that those who know God do not continue a lifestyle of unrepentant sin. According to 1 John 2, 3 through 6 and 3, 7 through 10. A desire for holiness is a hallmark of those who know God. And to know God is to love him. And to love him is to desire to please him. An unconfessed sin gets in the way of pleasing him. So a true child of God wants to confess, change, and restore their fellowship with God when it's lost. And this road to forgiveness and restoration begins when we decide to stop settling for an image of righteousness that allows for us to continue to deny our confession. God desires to delight in us and to fellowship with us. And when Christians fail to repent, God will lovingly discipline us. And if we find ourselves sinning without conviction, or without any desire to repent, we need to take a closer look at our relationship with God and see if we really even are in the faith. Because many times we angrily accuse God of leaving us when in truth we have left him or we never really were his. We just kind of got close with him a few times, but no commitment like a marriage like he requires. Possibly dating, but nothing more serious. Or a season of serious, but then went away when something else came along. When we stubbornly refuse to repent, we will be disciplined by our loving Father if we are truly in the faith. And the Lord's discipline can be severe and even leading to death when a heart has been hardened to the point of no return. That is supported by 1 Corinthians 11, 30, 1 John 5, 16. God longs for a restored relationship far more than we do. He pursues us, disciplines us, and loves us even while we are sinning, but he leaves intact our free will to continue sinning if we choose. We get to free will ourselves to heaven or hell. While Christ's perfect forgiveness cleanses us from all sin, this does not give permission for Christians to continue sinning. Though it does not change our status as saved and free from eternal condemnation, sin hinders a Christian's current relationship with God very drastically. And a Christian is called to confess sin in order to grow in his or her walk with God. And the Bible speaks of the importance of confessing sin we have committed. In 1 John 1, 9, we confess our sin, and then God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. James 5.16 also teaches, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. It should be our desire to honor the Lord with our lives and not to grieve him, as Ephesians 4.30 warns, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. An article written by BBC called Guilt, Bad for Your Health, reports the studies the results of a study that indicate that people who feel guilty have lower levels of antibodies associated with a strong immune system and the ability to fight off illness the researchers previous studies show that people with low levels of guilt are far less likely to go to the doctor or to report suffering from even colds and flu and god does not want us to experience the consequences associated with chronic guilt his desire is that we live in peace and joy which is available to us when we confess our sins and trust in God to forgive us. Peace and joy are health-promoting compared to chronic guilt, which can be damaging to our health 
And since the news is obsessed with health right now, and actually identifying people as Christian or non-Christian based on how they respond to different health decisions, you would think it would matter that the spiritual state that you are in is a massive indicator of how healthy you will be when facing sickness. So it does need to be considered that if you want to harbor and hide sin, you're going to get sick likely much easier than if you keep your conscience clear before God and man. A critical lesson for a born again child of God is that I should not cover up any sin. I just need to expose it no matter how terrible, small, unserious it may look and to the person God sends my way to open it up to because he's faithful to do that. God meets every need. So there's always a person that is going to be a safe person that you know that you can come to and you can confess that sin somewhere where there's not consequences associated with it, but someone, let's say, in your church family, ideally in your church, where you can go to someone and you can discuss what it is you're struggling with and they can help lead you out, pray with you. You need that person. I just need to say everything clearly when I'm repenting or confessing sin, you have to be clear how it happened, who you committed the sin with, if it involves another, to another born again man or woman of God who can give you advice and counsel you. Because after confession, restitution has to be made, which is very necessary for your healing. And it involves going back to correct one's mistakes and doing all necessary things that God places on your heart to do. Heaven and peace with God is worth it. I was radically born again. And I know that my sin was covered at that moment. But there were times in the years that followed where there was something that really bothered me, generally something I had taken from someone when I was actually not in Christ, but it bothered me. And I ended up reaching out to certain people and and giving back what I had taken and they oftentimes didn't know, some did. But what it ended up doing was creating an opportunity for why, because they were baffled why I would do that. Why would you approach me after all of these years and then do that or even just bring it up? And it gave me an opportunity to show them the power of Jesus Christ to save and to make someone different because I was very opposite of that kind of a person. I was a taker. And so it may not be if God prompts you to do something to make up for something you did before, which in this case was my pre-Jesus days, which wouldn't have necessarily been required. There's a different reason maybe that he's working on. And that in these cases, it was to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to this person. So God will work for different reasons and different ways in that restitution piece. He's oftentimes using you as a missionary due to your willingness to be humble and make and repair what you did. The dangers of not confessing one sin, no matter how serious they are, because we have a way of minimizing our choices. These are some of the dangers. Satan makes the person who is not willing to confess begin to tell lies to cover up their sins, even when God sends a mature Christian to them so that they can confess. They deny that process, and then they have to start telling stories around the what's actually happening. We've all seen that. I've done that. I was, I tell people I can't even write a book because I don't even know the truth. I told so many lies to get around so many things that I don't even know the truth about some of the things because I got to where I believe my own lies. And I don't really know what the truth is at this point about certain things that happened way back then. Another Satan gets the ground or the opportunity to torment a person's life by your own design. You opened the door. 
By not confessing your sin, you have given a highway for the spirit of torment to come in. That's his back against such a person because sin causes separation from God. So now you've got God opposing you. Next, Satan finally destroys and hinders the person's blessings that would be coming, goodness, promotion, or the great thing that God was about to do in your life. You have now just given the devil permission to destroy it. Next, Satan gets to hold up your, your life and he messes it up. That's just what he does. You open the door to him, he's always going to tear it up if you're a believer. He is going to make the biggest mess he possibly can and it will involve a lot of loss. Next, innocent, non-watchful or vigilant friends, family members can be negatively affected by the wrong decision of not confessing one sin. And many innocent people in the way can lose their life as a result of the refusal of a believer to repent of sin. And we see this especially in the field of addiction. Often other believers may think this person was attacked by the enemy, but they don't know that this person is actually refusing to confess hidden sin. And usually only those who have the Holy Spirit will know the truth. How many people are going to have to pay a price? How many people are going to have to pay a price before we're willing to humble ourselves? Next, finally, the person may lose the kingdom of heaven for eternity. While the host of heaven is not happy and they weep over someone who chooses to go lost, who refuses to repent, the host of hell is going to be glad and rejoice because they've won another and this was a determined choice by this person, a very persistent choice. When the conviction came, they ducked it, dodged it, and refused to engage it. And confessing their sin would have quickly changed everything for them, but they refused. Eventually, God will stop asking. The benefits of confessing one's sins to one another is it sets one free completely. You are made whole and you are healed. Next, it brings about prosperity and restoration of all that was lost. Actually, probably greater. Next, it reconnects you back to God and your relationship with God will come alive and you will receive more strength, more, more, more of Him to grow more and more with Him. Also, when the sin gets exposed, Satan gets exposed. He's disgraced, he's evicted, and he loses his hold on you. And above all, you're destined for heaven. Very clearly, you're positioned back with God and the host of heaven rejoices over you because you were lost and now you're found. You have chosen again to be a follower of Jesus Christ and not a resistor. Here's some things that are true of this area. Satan never sleeps. He roams about seeking for whom he may devour and also looking for an opportunity to attack a child of God. So no one needs so one always needs to be very watchful and prayerful, vigilant and sensitive in all times to the spirit because if, if you are confessing to be a born again believer, the devil is waiting for you to crack that door because he will kick it open. Next, we always have to be led and controlled by the Holy Spirit. Always. Next, flee sexual immorality. If you want a Pandora's box of devils to come in and just, you become so deluded that you don't even know anything at that point. You honestly think you're fine. If you want a Pandora's box of deception to come into your life, open a sexual immorality door, including pornography. That brings in the same host of hell that the actual act does because it does equal that it is sexual immorality it is adultery it leads to spiritual death and it leads to a very hard heart and the hard heart that comes from immorality does not even care that jesus is being denied in your life you will not care you will be so invigorated by the sin that how it's impacting jesus you don't even, doesn't even affect you. 
Next, study and meditate on the Word of God daily, putting on the full armor of God and praying for grace to do His will. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this verse was written to Christians, and it hinges on the word if. God offers a total pardon for every sin His children commit if we confess it to Him. The word confess implies agreeing with God about how bad our sin really is. We have to agree with God on our sin and repentance or turning away from it is then part of the confession. So you can't confess and agree it's bad and then not turn away from it and call that confession. That's a lie. For those who have not been pardoned by the blood of Jesus, every single sin that they have done and will do is unconfessed and unforgiven and eternal punishment awaits those who refuse to repent of their sin and accept the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ for their sin. But what about a Christian with unconfessed sin? According to the Bible, all of our sin was paid for when we accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So when we make that divine exchange at the cross, God chooses to see us as his righteousness. It is not our righteousness that he sees, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ that God now sees. And he switches the accounts with us, our terrible record for his perfect record. We have a full pardon and approval and acceptance from God from then on. When Christians refuse to seek God in confession and repentance, they will experience a broken fellowship with God, disrupted fellowship with other Christians, and they will not grow spiritually. John explains it like this. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way that he walked. 1 John 2, 1 through 6. Christians desire holiness and therefore seek to live pleasing to God. And unconfessed sin is definitely a barrier to pleasing God. Charles Spurgeon gives three reasons why someone would not confess sin to God and others. The first one is the sin itself prevents the confession. The person is stupefied by their sin, literally. They're fascinated, captivated, and held in bondage by it. They do not want to let it go. They enjoy it. They love it which is in direct opposition to the Holy Spirit. Two, there is such pride in their heart that one who has done wrong and knows it often will not own it. You cannot bring them to say, I have done wrong, because they are so prideful and arrogant, which is actually the nature of Satan. They have a line now with the enemy. Three, others have been silent because of fear. They cannot believe that God will forgive them they thought he would drown them in his wrath, but this is rooted in unbelief. Make sure that you're in the word because the word would clear this up for you. Filled with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit would clear this up for you. That is not true about God. It is a lie about God. And if you're in the word and filled with the Holy Spirit, you will know the lies about God and you won't fall for them. What does the Bible say? Proverbs 28, 13 says, If you hide your sins, you will not succeed. If you confess and reject them, you will receive mercy. Psalm 69, 5 says, God, you know what I have done wrong. I cannot hide my guilt from you. Psalm 44, 21 to 22 says, If we had forgotten the name of our God or lifted our hands to a foreign God, wouldn't God find out since he knows the secrets of the heart? Psalm 98 says, You have set our wrong... You have set our wrongdoing before you, our secret sins in the light of your face. Numbers 32, 23. But if you don't do these things, you will be sinning against the Lord. Know for sure that you will be punished for your sin. God knows everything about you and he's always watching us. 
Jeremiah 16, 17 through 18 says, I see everything they do. They cannot hide from me the things they do. Their sin is not hidden from my eyes. I will pay back the people of Judah twice for every one of their sins because they have made my land unclean. They have filled my country with their hateful idols. Psalm 139, one to two says, Lord, you have examined me and know all about me. You know when I sit down and when I get up, you know my thoughts before I think them. Psalm 139, three through seven says, you know where I go and where I lie down. You know everything I do. Lord, even before I say a word, you already know it. You are all around me, in front, in back, and you have put your hand on me. Your knowledge is amazing to me. It is more than I can understand. Where can I go to get away from your spirit? Where can I run from you? Luke 12, one through two says, so many thousands of people had gathered that they were stepping on each other. Jesus spoke first to his followers saying, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, because they are hypocrites. Everything that is hidden will be shown, and everything that is secret will be made known. Hebrews 4, 12-13 God's word is alive and working and is sharper than a double-edged sword. It cuts all the way into us where the soul and the spirit are joined, to the center of our joints and bones, and it judges the thoughts and feelings of our hearts. Nothing in all of the world can be hidden from God. Everything is clear and lies open before him and to him. We must explain the way we have lived. There is danger in unconfessed sin. Isaiah 59, one through two says, surely the Lord's power is enough to save you. He can hear you when you ask him for help. It is your evil that has separated you from your God. Your sins cause him to turn away from you. So he does not hear you. Psalm 66, 18 through 19 says, If I had harbored sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. However, God heard. He listened to my prayer. Repent of hidden sins you don't know about. Psalm 19, 12 says, How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Repent, turn away, and follow Jesus. 1 John 1 through 9 if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Purify feels like a great word to a lot of us who are, we have really defiled our lives in ways that are, to hear the word purify and to actually experience that is one of the most miraculous things for me. I could have grown another arm and it wouldn't even have been nearly as significant as being able to feel clean. There's nothing like it. Do I deserve it? No, not at all. But God gives me something that is worth more than a million dollars to me, and that is to experience cleanness. There's nothing like it. Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Unconfessed sin will cause a double life to develop and here are some indicators that that has happened. Pride. We know we're saved by grace, but after our conversion, we're fooled into believing that God wants what he wants from us is right, our righteousness, and yet we still sin. It's easier to settle for projecting an image of righteousness rather than walking in faith and repentance, just as a follower of Christ to make that a, a regular thing that we do. We become unwilling to confess how badly we need his grace. I enjoy being able to say that that I love being surrounded by women and men who are free to say how badly we need grace, that we know without Jesus, we have nothing. We have nothing. And what we do have, we don't want. We just want Jesus. Fear of man is another sign of a double life that has developed from unconfessed sin. We settle for an appearance of religious belief, generosity, speech, rather than the reality of each. Because we want attention, power, praise, honor, this is very dangerous territory to enter into. 
Shame is another evidence. Shame is that dirtiness we feel because of our sin and sometimes because of sin that's been committed against us. Shame keeps us in the dark. It keeps us living a lie because we're too fearful to face the truth that should have died at the cross where Jesus truly did bear our shame. We do prayer ministry here. That's our main function. We've had to go through a lot of around the mountain to get there. We started out doing that, but as a labor of love, we ended up in housing and a few other things. But now back to prayer, which is what is our calling and our purpose. The consequences of sin against others is astounding. I cannot even tell you how many people their lives were fractured by early molestation. So if anybody thinks that that's not a big deal, when you look at an incredibly gifted person spiritually, and then a human comes along and defiles that child, even as an early 10, 11, even in their teens, somebody comes along and touches or does something that is not theirs to do. That little person fractures and oftentimes become demonized at that point. And they end up going down a road because their identity got hijacked and they now can't face themselves because of something they now feel about themselves that they won't say, they won't tell anyone. They feel they are now, just like Tamar did in the Bible, just dirty, dirty, don't deserve to be loved by decent people. Addiction buries the shame and the humiliation of what someone else did to them that they never deserved. And I see many of them just wipe out in their life. And if you ask how many have had an early fracture from someone defiling them sexually, it's a shocking percentage of them. So what we desire to do is break that, all the connections that came from that, and work through the process to disengage that sin from them so that they can get their true identity back in Christ. If anyone has done that to someone else, I would clean it up this side of heaven because you will answer for it, answer for it on the other side. If you have wronged someone that way, I would definitely make amends this side of heaven because the damage is so great. You can't run from that forever. You need to help them. You need to ask for forgiveness. Passivity is another. Passivity, it happens to a lot of people around us. We see it in action, in action. It leads us to the path of least resistance and it will always be easier to not deal with our sin. It will always be easier to pretend to be holy. The longer we live with unconfessed sin and undealt with issues, the more difficult it will be to step into the light. You certainly won't be part of the battle because chronic passivity will always cause you to run if they're always hiding from the true battle and never walking through the door of faith and repentance. People who are passive should have stepped up many times, but didn't. And by the time they're willing, oftentimes it's too late. Another is lack of accountability. Call it accountability or transparency or whatever you want, but many don't have it and they don't want it. We need open and honest relationships in our lives. Those who demand that we honor Jesus and they hold our feet to the fire on that. We need those people. And if you really want to go out and make kingdom impact, you will have those people. It's critical to your survival out here that you have people that expect you to do the word. They expect it. Hiding our addictions is another sign. Hiding in our addictions, hiding our addictions. Any unconfessed sin exercises a measure of power over us. And we see this very clearly in addiction, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, marijuana. I can't even tell you how many people are smoking marijuana and claiming rights to it just because 
the country is fighting over what's legal and what's not, the principle of it is sinful. Please be careful why you're taking a lot of medication and make sure that it's for legitimate medical reasons. Opioids, prescription meds, gambling, food, shopping, video games, sex, pornography, religion, all of these things are idols. Just like in the Old Testament, they're the idols, the things that kept us from God. Another is running from our current or past issues. Everyone seems to have unresolved issues. We all seem to remember unresolved issues. It's the mistakes we've made, sin we've fallen into, maybe something entirely different. The issue is that we resist dealing with these issues. We run, we hide, we live a double life, we drown it out with activity. We drown it out, we drown it out, we drown it out. We find another way to drown it out. We just stay busy enough that we keep drowning it out rather than facing it. If you really want to do that the right way, find your accountability person, start there, and then say to them, please be honest and tell me what you see, and then start facing it. Another is pretending we're perfect. Why is it that our anger can let loose in private? But then when we step out into our work zone or the church, everything's fine. Suddenly everything's fine, really fine. Why is it that one person has two social media accounts, one to project to the general public and another for their private group because they're actually two different people? They have this one for this image and they have this one because this is who they are, for real. We're very good at projecting a false image to others. Self-deceit is another. The real danger in this double living from unconfessed sin is that we fool others, but we really have fooled ourselves. And you cannot fool the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 4.13 says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. A seared conscience is another, and this is a graphic term, but it has a big meaning. Our conscience is supposed to be soft and responsive to the work of the Holy Spirit and the Bible. The Word is supposed to be able to impact and change us. But as we walk in darkness and we keep ignoring the promptings of the Holy Spirit, our conscience gets seared and our hearts grow hard. And then we don't hear anymore. And then we're fine. We don't feel conviction, which most of us do on a daily basis just by how we're thinking. You don't feel that anymore because you think you're fine. You actually think you're fine. If you think you're fine, you really need to examine your heart because we're not fine. Isolation, sin isolates you. It separates you from God and others. And there are two basic choices we have when confronted with our sin. We confess our sin and begin to experience forgiveness and healing, or we hide our sin and we experience isolation. One path leads to life and true intimacy with God and others, and the other leads to death and loneliness. Spiritual death, frightening. Hypocrisy can lead ultimately to death. Peter acknowledges the spiritual warfare that was taking place with Ananias and Sapphira. And he says to them, why has Satan filled your heart? But still this couple are responsible for their actions because they allowed it. Satan came after Ananias and Sapphira. They were in the church and they did not stand firm in the faith. They did not. They chose another way. They chose another idol than Jesus. Jesus is not an idol. They chose an idol over Jesus. Another is loss of health and vitality. Psalm 32 is, writ is believed to be written by David after a sin with Bathsheba and, and when he had Uriah, her husband, murdered. And while this part of the Bible is more about confession, it still provides a clear impact of his loss of health without forgiveness. Listen to him contrast the joy of forgiveness with the physical suffering of unconfessed sin. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. 
When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Your, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Psalm 32, one through five. God provides healing and blessing through forgiveness, both for those confessing who are seeking forgiveness and those forgiving. But when David did not confess, he suffered physically. Research shows bitterness and grudges seriously impact your health. Another symptom or a uh, side effect of um, unconfessed sin and the double-mindedness it creates is the loss of joy. The greatest enemy to joy and high hopes is the cultivation of bitterness. The only alternative to forgiveness is vengeance and bitterness and there is no middle ground. No matter how hard you try to avoid the issue, so you ask yourself, do I want to forgive or do I want to be bitter and vengeful? Do you really want the consequence for unforgiveness, which we've been going through a very long list and it is a very long and devastating list. Proverbs 15, 17 says, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Hebrews 12, 15, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Bitterness and vengeance always hurt and destroy you as well as the others, and there's an open wound. Bitterness and vengeance is an open wound, and your life is draining out that wound as long as you leave it unhealed. It is healed by forgiveness. Another is a loss of freedom. What you are consumed with, controlled by, you will become like the offender. This is the, probably one of the worst consequences of unforgiveness, and it is so easy to fall into this trap. And this is why we say abused people become abusers. Um, people who were violated sexually go to violate sexually, things like this. You become consumed with the offender. How can you be free when you spend so much time thinking about how they hurt you? Your mind is stuck on trying to resolve something that only God can handle. And when you spend that much time thinking about them, you're building a very big house for them in your mind. You move them in and you constantly visit them. You become controlled by your offender. They not only consume your mind because they live in it, in a big house you made there for them. Worse yet, they control you. The longer you carry that grudge, the more they control you with your thoughts, actions, and feelings. The more you want vengeance, the more energy drains from you as you plot, seek, and try to find revenge. And even if you do get revenge, you will come to a place of regret. It wouldn't have been done right. It wouldn't have been done well enough. It wouldn't have accomplished what you wanted it to accomplish. It will never satisfy you. And finally, you will be conformed to be like the offender. When you immerse yourself into something, it becomes part of you. So the more energy you use and the more time you spend thinking about the person who wronged you, the greater the chance they have to influence your thoughts and actions, you increase the possibility of becoming just like them. And God wants a better path for you. He wants to renew your mind. He wants your mind controlled by his thoughts, by the truth, not the truth about what happened to you by the truth of God's word. And most importantly, he does not want you to renew your mind just to anything, not to good therapy. I'm not against therapists. He wants your mind renewed to his truth. Another is loss of hope. Depression, which there is a ton of out there right now, is often born from an unhealthy focus on the past. Not all, but a lot of it. And it can be birthed from trying to control a past event now and the unfairness of what happened and the loss of the lost hope because justice was not granted hope like joy doesn't grow from vengeance bitterness or holding grudges hope takes root in the soil of forgiveness you can't right a wrong that occurred in the past it happened it's a fact it's history you cannot change it but you can accept that it happened you can learn from it, forgive, and move on because your perfect Father in heaven knows about it. 
and he has promised to turn it into the best thing possible for you. And I am living in that. I've had some things done to me that are difficult to understand. They are the best tools I have out in this battlefield. I also have done some things to people that are difficult to understand. I've got both sides of that. But I am now willing to humble myself and face the truth about myself and I can tell people it's a miracle I'm saved. It is a miracle that I'm forgiven. It is a miracle that Jesus chose me. It is a miracle. If I can be saved, anyone can be saved. If I can speak for Jesus, anyone can speak for Jesus. I had some of the worst anxiety of most people I know. My social anxiety, I, I'm very introverted. I'm very rarely out in public. I never wanted to speak in front of people. I don't like it, but I'm so passionate for Jesus and the truth and the truth that was never presented to me. People just, even today, they minimize the truth of the Bible because they don't want to say the truth. They don't want to be one of the lone people out there declaring the truth because you do get hard, hit hard by people. They hit hard over it. There's been a lot of consequences to my life over speaking the truth but I should be in hell right now. There's no doubt in my mind, I should be burning in hell right now. So I'm fit for this because what I deserve, God has spared me. There is nothing that will happen to me this side of hell that is anything close to what I deserve. Research shows parents, unresolved issues get passed on to their children oftentimes. The feuds and hatred of people and families who cling to bitterness are evidence of the tenacity of sin and its transmission from parents to their children. Obviously, attitudes, words, and actions pass on to your children. Even if they learn from your mistakes and do not repeat them, they still suffer in other ways for your mistakes. Why let the consequences of unforgiveness create problems for your children and your grandchildren? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? God clearly states this in Exodus 25, 20, verse 5. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, meaning disobey and don't forgive. But God provides a solution. There's hope, there's joy, and there's blessing if you pay attention to what he says in Exodus 20, verse 6, next verse. But showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. The past is over, move on. Trust God to redeem your past. He knows what's best for you, and he's using this situation to even better you. And for the other person, trust him. Doing it any other way is only going to create more problems, but it is your choice. Forgiveness is the best way to deal with your memory of a wrongful pain. It's an opportunity to be free of the pain and probably help other people, even if that person was the one who hurt you. It's your choice to trust in God's way or your way. You get to pick, but your decision will have eternal consequences. And by the way, the alternative to forgiving is bitterness and vengeance. And that makes the pain much worse and last much longer. And it will affect you emotionally, mentally, and physically, and your generations to follow. You will end up cursing your children and grandchildren. Please don't choose that. Forgiveness puts a new future before you and gives you a new way to see those who hurt you. And it may be the one act that allows you to truly imitate God who is the true and initial forgiver. The solution is one, acknowledge your sin. The true measure of godliness is not found in the absence of sin, but in the presence of repentance. Walking in the light is not about sinlessness, but allowing God's light to expose your darkness. We must acknowledge our sin and the presence of sin in your life does not disqualify you from mature godly living 
but the absence of repentance does disqualify you. To confess your sin, the Bible says not only to acknowledge sin, but to confess it. Specific sin must be acknowledged specifically. This is where you need that person. Confession to God and to others is the means that the Holy Spirit has given us and uses to bring us out of darkness and into the light. And because sin isolates us, we are fooled into believing that we are the only ones who struggle with this particular sin. But how often is it that we hear another say, me too, when we say, I'm struggling with this thing. And this is why support groups are often very strong in bonds because people realize they're not the only one, that others are struggling and there's a, there's a camaraderie in that that's very strong. Three, receive forgiveness. When we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We get the faithful part, but what's the just part? Why is it an act of justice for God to forgive us? Because if you're a believer, Jesus has already paid the penalty for your sin and has already purchased your forgiveness. It would be unjust of God to punish both Jesus and you for that sin. Jesus has already paid it all. We receive that forgiveness of that sin by faith. Four, receive healing. Forgiveness is not all that's offered to us. The Bible tells us God will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgiveness itself is an incredible gift, but God desires to do more. He wants to restore us. He wants to cleanse us. And he desires to undo the effect of the sin in our lives. He desires to remove the dirtiness and the shame that we feel. And I again find that the most amazing part is to feel clean when i know in my mind what's all happened to feel clean is the greatest part for me to have peace with god and to feel clean if you have not confessed sins which you feel guilty of i urge you to prayerfully make that confession to god and someone you can trust so that you can return to feeling peaceful and joyful, which is God's will for your life.